Hello everyone, um, tonight's video lecture is going to be on a little different change of pace here because tonight my plan is to start talking about the big research paper project that you have to do for me um, this quarter in the class. Um, so we'll, we'll talk, the, my plan is kind of like this. Um, I want to talk about the sort of parameters for the assignment as it pertains to this particular class. Um, the business ethics class because this is a little different than some of the papers that I have for my other philosophy students but then most of the lecture is going to be um, or most of this video will just be about how to write philosophy papers in general like it's a little different of a game than um, other kinds of paper projects for other classes especially like English paper projects and and I'm actually gonna do a little bit of like comparing and contrasting of writing for philosophy as opposed to writing for other things or other types of writing projects that um, schools maybe ask you to do in the past, um, what might be different here. And I'm going to be trying to give you as many um, tools and models and frameworks um, to help you in that process to anticipate what might be different here and have a vision about how it might look for you to do this project yourself so kind of like getting brought into this world of doing your own original philosophical work um we've it's uh, some of the things i'm going to talk about in this class uh, this session tonight um might not be completely unfamiliar given everything that we've talked about before especially like going back to the beginning of the quarter stuff from like the code of intellectual conduct I definitely think that the Code of Intellectual Conduct is a, an important um, tool or model in terms of fleshing out this vision about how to do your own philosophical work. Um, but uh, there's a lot of other things that I can offer too. So that's that's my main plan for tonight's um, lecture. We'll see how much we've got time for, um, and maybe we might even get done early, but I, it, it's possible. <laughs> I always seem to use up the space somehow but um but that's what tonight's lecture is all about it's just sort of getting ready gearing up for doing this this big research paper and um you know there's also probably going to be some things i'm going to talk about that will be familiar because you've been already doing some writing for me in the class with the journal assignments um and the reading comments and for those of you the few of you who have done um, presentations already you've kind of been moving in that direction so all that stuff is really good preparation for this big project um but tonight the focus is going to be on that um really directly okay um so stuff about this particular project and then just about writing philosophy generally so um i have talked with a few of you um on the phone about what kinds of things to maybe do for a paper project there's still a lot of you that I haven't talked to uh, and that's the first thing I'd want to say is um, in terms of how to proceed here uh, as soon as you get any idea any little inkling of what you might want to do for your paper project um, please contact me and talk to me about it first don't go and do a bunch of work before you've kind of gotten a green light from me about um, how to uh, how to attack this and maybe some advice about how to proceed with it um, definitely I'd say the hardest well maybe this is just my advice about it but I feel pretty confident saying this is probably gonna be true for you too um, one of the most one of the most difficult things about writing for philosophy is just picking a topic just getting a direction laying out a project uh, an ambition, a, a goal that you're trying to shoot for in that paper, setting that up is one of the most intimidating things about writing for philosophy. Um, the ball is really in your court um, for deciding like what needs to be talked about and what you're going to talk about and how are you going to frame success and failure with that paper. Um, all of that early, early brainstorming work um, which might even feel like it's before brainstorming of just like picking the subject matter that you're going to address um, So much of the work of good philosophy papers is about picking that in a good way uh, Setting up that uh, initial idea that initial inspiration for your paper um, so uh, I definitely want to be a part of that step with you um, And I can I think I can give a lot of personalized advice and feedback once I get an idea of what you're maybe trying to do or thinking that you might want to do um, I can help you refine that um, along the way. And I, I really, I, I'd like to be a part of this process with you at every stage of the journey. 
uh, as much as you're willing to let me be a part of it or invite me to be a part of it. Um, but certainly for this picking up a, of a topic, um, I'm not going to make an official assignment about it, but I'm definitely going to strongly, 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 strongly encourage you to kind of think about this as like clearing a topic with me. Um, saying, hey, Tim, I think I want to do my paper on this issue, this question. I'm going to be taking this position on it. Um, or maybe you're not sure and you're like, I'm interested in the topic. I'm not sure what I think is the right answer yet, but maybe here's where I'm leaning or here's what I think of as significant with that um, issue with uh, resolving that philosophical question. question. Um, and then I can kind of take a look at that and maybe give you some advice about where to go with it. Um, okay, so please, that's that'd be like step one is start thinking about a question uh, a topic that you want your paper to address and then come and talk to me about it. Um, this, when I teach my 101 class, which is, you got a couple documents from me from the, uh, over the weekend, um, that actually I attach to that, um, uh, my weekend update announcement that I always do. One of them was about, uh, I called it instructions and grading for paper. And that's what you're, uh, I've got up on the screen right now for those of you watching this on YouTube later. Um, and then the other document was called Writing for Philosophy. And the Writing for Philosophy document, um, which we'll take a look at here in a little bit, um, was written for my 101 students. And so in my 101 class, I make my students write an original philosophy paper. But we kind of do it as a guided project throughout the quarter. So it's actually split into a bunch of different assignments. Um, including like a detailed outline um, that has like all the intellectual work for the paper in it and then a draft and then a final draft. There's all these different steps to it uh, that I use to kind of help my 101 students be guided along the process of, of putting together a good philosophy paper. Thank you. Um, and uh, we're not doing that here. You'll notice um, there's really just the final draft, like straight up. So the first thing I'd want to say is that in terms of the that step-by-step -step procedure, first clearing a topic with me and us having a conversation about just what vision you've got for what you want to do here, um, then it's just like straight into final draft. And there actually are steps in between that I would encourage you to take. Doing a detailed outline really helps. Um, I force my 101 students to do it because it's just kind of like a good policy for writing philosophy generally. I was definitely, um, I, I can be honest about this, I was a student, like when I first got to college, my first, mm, probably my first year, and definitely throughout high school, I could just kind of barf out papers last minute and get A's. And I got really used to doing that. That I had strong enough writing skills that I could put together a thought and it would be coherent and I could ar articulate it and make arguments and um, and I could get by pretty well that way. And then I started taking my philosophy classes in college and um, I wasn't able to do that quite as well. I actually had some instructors that would kind of like call me out on a little bit. Uh, philosophers are pretty rigorous in terms of um, evaluating the kind of reasoning that's being offered. Um, sometimes in other um, classes I took as an undergrad uh, they weren't quite so, they wouldn't kind of rake you over the coals quite as much as in a philosophy class. Um, so I noticed that. I mean, my grades were kind of suffering a little bit. But also, I was just sort of recognizing that I wasn't producing very good work. Um, the things that I was able to sort of articulate or explore when I was writing a paper and just kind of barfing it out last minute were just not that solid. They didn't hold up under very much scrutiny. Um, and when I started just planning out my thoughts first, like really thinking through, you know, what makes sense here? What am I trying to say? How am I trying to argue for it? What can my opponent say? Um, really thinking through all that and making a plan first and then drafting the paper and figuring out how to articulate those ideas in the best way. The quality of my papers just shot up a ton. Just doing some quick brainstorming to make a plan and edit the plan and then compose the paper later, that was really, really, really helpful for increasing the quality of the work. And I, uh, so I, now that I'm on the other side of being the teacher, I want to kind of encourage my students to not make those kinds of mistakes and learn from my mistakes too. Um, I think you will produce much better work this quarter 
work that maybe you'll be more happy with as well, not just in terms of a final grade or things like that, but just feeling like you you did something, you like accomplished something in this class that you can be proud of, um, and that you maybe explore your own thinking and your own perspective on a difficult issue in a much more satisfying way. I think this m way of proceeding will serve you so much better. So what does that mean? It doesn't mean that you need to write a draft in the next couple of weeks so that you're way ahead of the curve. What it does mean is that you should start thinking about your topic now. And as soon as you get a green light from me about like, yeah, I think this paper topic is going to work. And I also probably have some advice about like what direction to develop it. Start thinking about it kind of periodically, like all the time. One of the best pieces of advice I got in grad school for, for paper writing, because when you're a graduate philosophy student, you're just dreading end of term every term. <laughs> you're like, I know I've got these, I have to do some major philosophical projects by the end of the semester. Um, and the whole time you're just kind of dreading, what are you going to do? What do you, what do you have to say? What can you put some work into? Um, and one of the best pieces of advice I got was like, think about your paper, not just when you're sitting down, like don't, it's not just a matter of scheduling time where you're going to sit down in front of your computer with your fingers on the keyboard and type out a bunch of stuff and rewrite it and all that kind of stuff. But also just have it working on the background, like have it simmering on the back burner of your mind all the time. So <clears throat> um, I take the bus and stuff. So I'm like, when I'm on the bus, think about my paper, taking a shower, think about my paper, like getting ready for school, think about the paper. Like anytime you've got a spare moment, maybe go back to that, whatever topic that you're working on be like, what are the other things here to be sensitive with? Um, I actually have been working on, um, I'm going to be giving at Bellevue College, I'm going to be giving a kind of campus-wide uh, philosophy talk next week on Tuesday. Um, so I've been working on this whole process really concurrently right now. Um, and that's what I've been doing. I've been like, I, I put together an initial plan or inspiration for what I want the talk to be able to accomplish philosophically. Um, I know what controversy I want to address, what philosophical questions I want to try to answer. And I just kind of like let it simmer away. And the more that I let it simmer and I spend just some time reflecting on it, the more new things pop up. I'm like, ooh, that's an important thing that needs to get into the discussion. Like, ooh, that's a possible argument from my opponent that I need to address. Um, or... Um, that might be a really good argument for me to use to defend my position. Um, things on that order. Um, sorry, I have to fix that little video here. Um, there we go. Um, and uh, and then when I sit down to actually like type up PowerPoint slides or in your case like a paper or something like that. I've already got a bunch of stuff on the radar. I've already got the sort of brainstorming work of like, how is this going to be a rich conversation? What are the things that I need to be tracking? Rather than like, sit, once you sit down with those fingers on the keyboard, you're just like, uh, where do I start? <laughs> so doing some of that brainstorming in the background is, is really, really helpful. Um, so that I think helps with the intimidation factor with a project like this. Um, philosophy is asking for a lot and it's, um, we're going to be asking for your paper to be very dense and to be considering the opponent and all this kind of stuff. Um, like you've seen demonstrated in all the papers that we've been reading so far in the class. That's the kind of thing that you want to be emulating with your paper too. Um, so let's, let's start getting into what are those things that we want to be emulating or what is, what is sort of the substance of this vision um, of what we're looking to do in a philosophy paper. But in terms of just a procedural sort of thing, my advice is don't do it last minute you will have this this project will just be a bear if you're trying to do it all last minute um, really set yourself up for success and that means starting to think about it now starting to talk to me about it early um, and then working on it kind of continually also ooh, this is another just personal advice I have when you're doing that kind of ubiquitous brainstorming kind of like simmering on the back burner all the time um, when you got an idea write it down it might feel like you're going to be able to remember it because it's so important when you're like, oh, I definitely need to talk about that, or that's a really good argument, or that's a real good point for my opponent I need to address. It might feel like 
and the moment when you're considering it, it's like really like meaningful. It's it's meaningful. That's what philosophy is all about. Um, and you're like, there's no way I'm going to forget this. If you're like me, um, you'll forget it. <laughs> so I've learned that the hard way. Like when I've got something going on, I definitely need to um, sort of uh, plan, plan, find find some way to externalize it so that I can um, recall it later. So I definitely would give that kind of personal advice um, based on my own experience. Um, okay, well, let's get into this a little bit. Um, in terms of picking a topic, that's where everything starts. Um, in my guide here for writing for philosophy, um, I've got kind of step one is picking a topic, and then step two is identifying a thesis. Uh, in the writing, the general writing guide, this is much more generally described. Um, but for our purposes, this would be like for one I 101 students. For our purposes, all that stuff's going to be true. So you can take everything that's in this writing for philosophy guide here, uh, but then add to it just this extra condition that you have to address some ethical controversy in the world of business. And I'll talk about the kind of two routes. I mentioned these before. I think really early on in the quarter when I was talking about the paper project, maybe in the syllabus. Um, but let's let's start with actually the general advice that I've got here about um, writing for philosophy. Um, I mentioned that there's two kind of ways that most philosophers write a philosophy paper. Sometimes they already have a position or like a thesis, an answer that they want to defend. Um, so they might know that going in, uh, and then they're kind of that's kind of like a standard approach. It's really easy to figure out how to develop the paper from there because then you just need to figure out how to argue in defense of your position. What could your opponent say? Like um, charity principle and rebuttal principle from the code of intellectual conduct, and then to respond to those concerns, and boom, you've got a paper. In, in its essence, boiled down, philosophy papers are not that complicated. Um, but then, of course, the devil's in the details, and they get complicated really fast. But in terms of the major functions of a paper and its sort of segments, um, a philosophy paper is really about framing a question, indicating your answer, arguing for it, entertaining objections and resistance from your opponent, giving responses to that, and that's it. Now, what I just listed is maybe not the best way to think about organizing the paper, but that's definitely the main functions that we want a paper to satisfy. And you'll see this in the guides uh, over and over. I kind of talk about those themes. Um, but that that's kind of a straightforward approach to brainstorming if you already know what answer you have. But it's very possible that you don't. And that's okay. You don't need to have all the answers going into working on this paper, actually. Um, I say here other times, many times, um, and I witness this a lot with not just myself as work doing professional work in philosophy, but many other professional philosophers that I met, my instructors, my peers, people from other schools, stuff like that. Um, a lot of times, philosophers just start with a question that they're interested in, and they don't know what position they want to defend on that question yet. They don't know what answer they want to give. That can feel a little scary. And you're like, I still don't know what I'm actually going to say in my paper. Um, but it doesn't need to be scary. You don't need to have that thesis first. You could just be exploring the question and thinking about, in terms of your brainstorming, what are the issues that are relevant to that question? So if there's, there's some possible disagreement or controversial issue in some sector of business ethics, um, you can think about what are the different sides here, what are the different options, um, what are the different possible answers. You're not sure which one is yours yet, but you might just sort of brainstorm and think about what the possibilities are. And then start thinking about what are people in that debate, or people who might be taking different perspectives on it, what are the things that sort of motivate them? Like what are the possible areas or aspects of moral interest, of moral relevancy? that could affect the way that that question is going to receive an answer. What are the things people are worried about or that they have positive concerns about, like something that they want to make sure to protect? Um, and you, you can start populating the territory of this debate. And then once you've populated it, then you might look at that and be like, okay, given all of these relevant considerations, 
this is the position that looks like it has the most going for it argumentatively, and then that's a position that you're going to defend. Um, but the first thing here, in terms of like picking picking a topic, um, is identifying a a question of controversy. So that'd be like the first major thing that I'd want to make sure that your paper is doing. It needs to be addressing an issue of controversy. And that's actually here in my um, instructions for the business ethics um, paper here. Um, I talk here about um, the debate that you will contribute to is something substantial and controversial. In other words, a position you take as significant and legitimate opposition. I don't want you arguing against straw men. You want to have a topic that actually perplexes us and where we need to have some someone doing some work thinking about it to work out what the truly right answer is. And in this paper, you're going to be providing this service to us to think deeply and contribute to some question where we're not sure what the answer is. Um, this is one of the most important things. I'm actually, it's in later when I get to my grading criteria. Um, that's the, one of the major things I'm looking for. Is the debate you have framed a controversial one? Is your opponent a reasonable opponent? Do they have a plausible chance of being right and posing a threat to your position? You know that you're actually in a good spot with picking a topic if you're not sure if you're going to be able to defend yourself against the, uh, the opponents. So if you look at people on the other side and you're like, damn, they have some pretty good arguments. I don't know if I'll be able to deal with all those things. Then that means you're in a good spot, not a bad spot. Okay, so uncertainty, um, maybe even a lack of conviction on your part with a, your topic is actually a good thing. That shouldn't be a reason to not pick the topic. Don't pick a topic that is just on the grounds of, I think I'll be able to defend this. I think I'll be able to convince people that this thing is right. The chances are you might be addressing a topic that's far too trivial. Having a controversial uh, topic is super, super, super important. And I want to, um, I think I've talked about this idea before, but I really want to clarify it now when we're talking about the paper. There's a major difference between something being controversial and something being a matter of rational controversy. So we could just define pretty basically something that's controversial is just something that has disagreement and deep disagreement where people like, you know, kind of get all hot and bothered about it. That'll make for a controversy, like a scandal or something like that, um, where people have different differing opinions. Um, but we need something more than just that for this philosophy paper. We need something that is a matter of rational controversy. So it's not just something that people disagree about, but that they disagree about it and have good or seemingly good reasons to back up their position. You can imagine a controversy existing where one side is just clearly wrong. They just don't know the facts. Um, they're, they're, there's nothing going on here. And yet, or they, they, they might have like a ton of bias going on. So something might be controversial in that sense, but it doesn't really, um, it's not something that's really perplexing for anyone who spends the time informing themselves about what's going on with that issue and sort of thinks reflectively about it. If just being informed and a little bit of reflective thinking sort of resolves that question in a very obvious sort of way, then that's not a rational controversy. Okay? So you'll know that you've got a good paper topic that's meeting this condition of having a rational controversy if when you think about your opponent, the someone who would be like on the other end of that debate, um, or if you're not sure what side you're on, just imagining the possible positions, that all those possible positions have something to say for themselves that makes their position look like this is the one that might win in terms of figuring out what's the most rationally defensible position out there. I mean, almost any belief that, I'm, I'm kind of an optimist about this, I'm a little bit of a hippie about some things, I definitely think no matter how wrong-headed a position might be, no matter how ignorant or whatever, right, or full of bias or something like that, there's always some logic going on to what anyone ever believes. I'm very charitable about most people's beliefs um, that I think, like, there's always something to be said for it. The question is, is it something substantial? Is it something that is, um, like, really a, a major concern uh, rationally speaking. So like, for example, let's say you got two possible answers or positions on a philosophical question. 
one side's got something to say for themselves, but they their arguments have like this kind of strength, and the other one has like all of this strength. Like they've got a very very strong case to make, and the other one can like only squeak out this much. The fact that they have something to say doesn't necessarily mean that there's a rational controversy here. Um, so that that's a really good acid test to know whether you're doing a good job with this. Here's another way you can think about it though. Let's say you've got strong convictions on this debate. So in other words, you're like, no, I think there is a clear winner, and I think it's this one. So it might be hard for you to motivate an opponent. But try to maybe imagine, you, you can just kind of do this as a thought experiment. Imagine whether there's any room for someone who's just like coming to the debate n new. They don't have a relationship with it. Um, they don't, they're not aware of all the controversy or something like that. They're just, they're just coming right into the debate fresh. Could they kind of be like, okay, what do you have to say? And what do you have to say? And what do you have to say? Like all the different people that are in that debate. Um, and if, if there's any room for them to be like, huh, man, I'm not sure which one of these I want to agree with. You know, someone who doesn't have any commitments yet, who's kind of like a neutral observer, right? And they become informed about all the different ways that people are looking at this. And they're like, I'm not sure. I'm not sure which one to pick. Um, there isn't a clear winner here. Boom. Now you've got a topic that meets this criteria and that you can do some good work on. So I, um, I love saying this to my 101 students when, that, when they're working on their paper. Um, and I, it's kind of what I described uh, here in, um, let me bring it back up, this, uh, da, 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 where is it? I just had it. Oh, yeah, 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 the, the kind of service that you're provi providing to us. Um, I like you to think about it like this. In a philosophy paper topic, or just a philosophy paper do, doing this kind of argumentative ambition, um, you're really kind of like an agent operating on behalf of everybody like all of humanity, like we've got these questions, like this might sound a little epic, maybe a little melodramatic, but just, just go with it. I actually think that this is totally appropriate, uh, the, even though it's not melodramatic, it's just dramatic. Um, this is what philosophers do. They're like, there, there are some questions that anyone who like thinks about stuff or like has any kind of sincerity in approaching life um, may ask themselves and be genuinely perplexed by and it's kind of imagining that in order to resolve those questions or perplexity, it's going to take some work. And that's what you're doing in this paper. You're taking some time out of your life, albeit forced. I'm forcing you to do it because it's graded and everything. So there's that. Um, but you're, you're kind of taking some time out of your life to work on one of these problems. Try to come up with a solution to it or kind of do some research, even if that research is just... Although you will have some research sources I'm requiring for this paper, but this is also research in philosophy. Just like, hmm. hmm. Oh, nah, 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 nah. these different things, trying to just like track and be sensitive to what matters in the debate. Um, and then you're reporting back to us about your findings. Like, hey, I put some time and energy into this one. I'm trying to crack this nut. Here's where I think it stands. And then that's your paper. Like all the arguments in your paper, all the discussion is kind of you reporting on the fruits of those reflective efforts to try to resolve this question for all of us. Um, so that uh, that's, that's like the best um, image I think I've got to offer for how to like orient yourself in attacking this paper project. Um, it can feel like there's a lot of pressure on you. You might have a lot of personal convictions about this. Um, you also might get really distracted by all the um, other conversations that happen, like from other sources that you're reading or other people that you know who have opinions about this or stuff that you're hearing from other people. Um, but you, this is your job to kind of like take all of that and process it and try to think about it on behalf of everybody. Um, what is the sort of the best answer here? What, it, what, what could we be thinking about when we're trying to come up with the right answer? Um, so that, that's kind of, uh, an image you as an agent on behalf of all of humanity to try to solve some problem, some issue of perplexity. Uh, it, 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 it needs to be controversial because if it's not controversial, it gets a trivial answer. That's not something we need work done on, <laughs> right? So that's what I'm saying about how, if you're not sure about whether you're going to be able to succeed in your ambitions, 
that's a great sign that you're on the right track of doing something that matters for a philosophy paper. And then I'm, I'm actually building that into the grade, um, that you're at least targeting something where we do have questions about it, that there isn't a clear answer about it. Um, if you're finding defending your thesis is happening really easily and that your opponents basically don't have a leg to stand on, you probably need to switch topics about it. But this is another thing that it will be useful for coming and talking to me about what you're thinking about doing. I can help you anticipate or think about where your opponents might come from. Is this controversial? Is it not controversial? That sort of stuff. Okay. Um, this, I think, is the right time to mention this. In our, oh, by the way, in the chat, how are we doing? How are we doing so far? Like I mentioned before we got started, you're, you're really my canary in the coal mine for everyone on YouTube. Um, this, this vision is coming through so far. Awesome. Okay, wonderful. All right. If there is anything that's like unclear, I, I really want to hear from you about it because um, I've been thinking about this stuff and talking about it with students so many times. Sometimes it's a little harder for me to kind of get back into that mindset of like, you know, coming at this stuff fresh for the first time, trying to navigate the territory, you know, what kinds of stuff might you come up against um, that I could maybe help with or give advice about or, or like help how to welcome you into this world as best as I can. Li Ling, I, I'm not sure I understood what that last text was. It looks like maybe typo or oh 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 yeah oh I see <laughs> uh, sorry the uh, the capitalization on a threw me off there um, uh, so there are okay so well I'll we'll take a little interlude here to talk about the mechanics of this as an assignment for the class um, the length of the paper the minimum length of the paper that's what Li Ling was asking about those of you on YouTube um, the length of the paper is minimum 2,000 words, and that's here in my instructions. Um, yeah, I am using length as a minimal grading criteria, but I'm not using it in terms of uh, what kind of grade to give you, but just whether I'm going to accept it as a completed assignment. So this minimum word count of 2,000 words is not something flexible. Like I say here, if you send me a paper with... 1,999 words, I will send it back to you and ask you to send me an extra word because <laughs> I will not count that as completed. Um, if, but if you're really, if you're struggling to get to 2,000 words, then there's probably some other things going on wrong or things that we could do to make the paper better, like as I say here, more robust um, in, the, uh, in this document with the instructions. So uh, if you're worried about that, talk to me sooner rather than later um, so that we can kind of target that and figure out what to do about it. But in terms of length, it's a minimum of 2,000 words. And then um, I always have students kind of getting different reactions to hearing that as a minimum word count. For some students, this sounds like a lot and is kind of scary and intimidating. If you follow my advice in this video and in these documents I've sent out, getting to 2,000 paper of uh, 2,000 words um, will maybe not be as scary as it sounds because 2,000 words is actually not that much space in order to actually accomplish something philosophically. As soon as you start thinking about all those different tasks that need to happen in the course of the paper, <clears throat> framing a question in controversy, articulating what your position and answer to that question is, giving defense, all the arguments in support of your position, that's going to take a lot of time, and then especially thinking about where are opponents going to be coming from. Where are the objections going to come from? What are the arguments on the other sides of the d debate? And then to respond to them too, to give like adequate rebuttals to their concerns. This is these things are going to explode the paper in terms of word count and length. Um, I'm I am going to be asking you to kind of approach writing it the way that you've seen these other philosophers writing. Uh, we're going to do Hedinger on Thursday. Hedinger is such a good example. He's packing so much argumentative content in a very small space. Um, not having fluffy composition uh, and prose is really a plus for philosophy. You want to try to get as many arguments and ideas into this paper as you possibly can. And I, I, I think um, 
especially with the the fact that this is going to be a research paper and you're going to have to integrate I'm requiring three quality sources more on that in a second here um, doing all of those things should be no problem to get to 2,000 words and if you're struggling with that definitely bring me in on the loop on that and let me give you some advice and help and guidance with it there's a lot that I can do there um, just to kind of uh, give an indication my instructions and grading parameters that document is 1500 words <laughs> so that's just like describing the paper project itself is already at 1500 words because there's all these things that we care about um, that you'll want to be doing so I think um, if you're following the instructions and trying to meet the objectives for the assignment getting to 2000 words shouldn't be a problem and you might find yourself doing a lot more than that and I don't have an upper limit here there's no word count maximum I encourage you to get as ambitious with this as you want to to maybe like treat your topic right to like have a sincere exploration of your debate that you might if you want to write if you wanted to write a 9,000 word essay I wouldn't have any problems with that um, especially given my background uh, when I was an undergrad I was notorious for turning in like 20 page papers for five page writing assignments to my philosophy instructors and they hated me for it so now that I'm on the other side of this uh, I definitely am not going to be a hypocrite um, and I'm going to encourage you to do that I actually wish that they had been you know inspiring us to be a little bit more ambitious with our work and um, I, I'm not going to be requiring something like that of course but if you want to do it I'm so down for that um, philosophy can go really deep and if you want to dive into it in a deeper way that's totally cool um, another question that was asked um, before the lecture got started uh, just in terms of the parameters of the assignment was when is it due and uh, the due date's going to be a week out from the end of the quarter um, so I don't know exactly what the last day of the quarter is but whatever that is a week out from that is when this final draft will be due and the reason for that is that I'm actually going to be um, having uh, an anonymous exchange of drafts, drafts, so of your final papers, um, and then you'll do a response paper. You'll kind of like the presentation paper that you're doing, where you're responding to one of the readings that we're covering in the class. You'll be doing that kind of evaluation of the merits and deficiencies of the arguments of one of your peers' papers. So to give you time to be able to complete that assignment, the the papers are due a week out so then you'll have the last week to do the response paper assignment um, so that's that's how the timing for the due dates gonna go um, any other questions from those of you in the chat just in terms of like the nuts and bolts and mechanics of of this assignment So um, the uh, sorry, everyone in YouTube. I paused the video for uh, while people in the chat were typing things, just so there wasn't a bunch of dead time on the video. Um, and the the parameters to clarify a little bit about the parameters and details of this response paper assignment. It's going to be pretty much exactly the same as the presentation paper. I'll be asking for 800 words um, as a length for that assignment and your main um, job the instructions for that response paper are to critically evaluate the arguments in the students paper that you were uh, anonymously assigned um, so there they will I'm gonna like go through all the paper final papers remove all the names and identifying marks and the sort of the tags that are in word documents and things like that so I'm gonna scrub them clean of their identity and then I'm gonna send them out randomly um, to other students and so you'll get someone's paper you can read it you can talk to me about it if you got any questions and then sort of do this evaluation of what arguments w worked which ones didn't what you sort of think of their position um, just like you're doing for these presentation paper thingies um, so it's really the same sort of stuff okay the only other nuts and bolts thing here for the paper directly that's probably this is since we're talking about it this might be the right time to do it um, is this research component so 
I've got here at the end for 360 students only because um, I do teach a version of this class that's 260 that doesn't have the research project co uh, component to it. Um, but you're in the 360 class, so this is required. <laughs> but I, I am asking you to do this as a research paper. And that means that you're going to need to bring in some sources here. But I've changed the, the parameters for, uh, for this from how I've done it when I first started teaching this class. Um, <clears throat> because the first time I taught it, um, I was like, I want 10 sources, which is not unreasonable um, for a philosophy paper. Uh, and people started just padding up their research sources with articles from the internet um, that were a lot of times like factual or not b written by philosophers. They're just kind of like opinion pieces from anywhere. Um, and I was like, you know what? It seems like people are, under, are feeling a lot of pressure to just get to 10 sources. So then I cut it down to five and then I still sort of felt like that was happening. So now I'm cutting it down to only three. Um, you only have to have three sources to make this a research paper, but there's a big caveat to that. I call them that they need to be quality sources. So I'll be factoring that into your grade when I'm deciding what sort of grade to give you for the for this this paper. I'll be looking at the sources that you ended up using and whether they are presenting something substantive or whether they're really just padding. And so I've got some um, I've got some help here about what does it mean to talk about a quality source. So I say here uh, in the instructions and grading for paper document, quality here refers to whether the source is contributing something substantial to the discussion. So something argumentatively substantial over to the discussion over your thesis. So like the position that you're going to be defending in the paper. Is it providing some important material for arguments in favor of your thesis? or in opposition to your thesis. So you might pull work from other philosophers that are like on your side. And you can you can stand on the shoulders of giants, that's okay. Um, you don't have to come up with all the arguments yourself. Um, we a, a whole big part of doing philosophical work is listening to other people and being like, hey, that's a good idea. I think that's a good idea, and then working that in. Um, your whole paper can't be this though, because um, then you're not contributing anything yourself. Um, but that's the whole idea of like standing on the shoulders of them, maybe using them as a foundation or a starting point. Um, for instance, like, uh, you know, let's say, let's, this is just, I'm just pulling this out of thin air. But let's say you wanted to write about, we just got done doing Davis, Duska, and Larmer. Let's say you wanted to write about the topic of employee loyalty. And you were like, Duska's got a really interesting idea here about what kinds of relationships could be a proper basis for loyalty. Um, but then you're like, I don't think that's right, or I disagree with it, or maybe that you do agree with it. You could bring in Duska as like a source, and that's exactly what Larmer does. Remember, like Larmer, Larmer's papers are really good. Like, just if you want an example of how you could write a paper, he's like, here's this question, here's this controversy, here's a dude who made like a big contribution to it. Larmer talks directly to Duska, right? He's like, here's what Duska says, and I don't think that's right. Um, so it could be someone who's in opposition too, or in support. Um, but it needs to be something that's offering like substantive philosophical material. Um, uh, sources that are only reporting facts about a case, for example, are not quality sources. So most journalism, uh, most articles from newspapers, things like that, those are not quality sources. A Wikipedia definition, not a quality source. A quality source would be a philosophy paper, like a published work of philosophy that presents an argument relevant to the controversy that you're addressing. That would be a quality source. And I've got some advice about how you can track down these things. Um, I've mentioned before the plato.stanford.edu, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. That is a very, very, very good source. Um, Depending on what topic you've selected, you might be able to find a whole entry on the question that you are trying to address. Um, and it might you might find, um, yeah, Li Ling, um, just search for Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. If you want to type it in directly into your web browser, it's just Stanford, S-T-A-N-F-O-R-D. Um, or I'm sorry, Plato, P-L-A-T-O dot Stanford, S T A N. Uh, F-O-R-D dot E-D-U. Um, 
that's a uh it's kind of like wikipedia for philosophy but way more in depth because all of the entries are written by professional philosophers and it's peer reviewed so that means this is like uh, an academic journal um it's written by professional philosophers for professional philosophers though so sometimes it's a little not so accessible it can get really complicated and very detailed really fast but if you um and i'd be happy to help you through like digging through one of those entries um, but their bibliographies are really, really good. So if you want, if you want to see like where, what are people saying about my topic? What are people saying about this question? Um, sometimes you can find a Plato, uh, a, a Stanford Encyclopedia entry about it, um, and that might give you some direction about where to track down other, uh, other sources. Um, the other thing though, like Stanford, the Stanford Encyclopedia is usually for big picture philosophical topics. Sometimes for something really specific in business ethics, you're not going to find an entry. Um, or maybe your topic is only tangentially discussed as a part of some other entry. Um, in which case, I would recommend going at um, some more of your general academic research gateways, like through the library. The research gateway at the library, you can search business ethics journals. And there are journals specifically on business ethics. In fact, if you're really hurting up for a topic, you could, uh, that you're like, I'm not sure what I even want to talk about. You might just peruse some of the uh, different, like even paper titles from these different uh, academic journals that are specifically designed to deal with issues in business ethics. Like Business Ethics Quarterly is probably the most famous one. Um, there's a few of them out there. Um, and just look at what people are talking about and maybe you'll get inspired to be like, ooh, I want to get in on that debate. I have something to say about that or I care about that question and I want to explore it. Um, that's, a, that's a perplexity that I want to put some time working into. Um, so that's really good. I really recommend um, – there's a website that has started to become much more useful. Uh, it's kind of curated by professional philosophers, but it's called Phil Papers. Um, and I think it's here. Let me pause the video for a second. I'm just going to double check this to get the year. Sorry about that interlude. Um, so it's Phil Papers, P H I L P A P E R S dot org, O R G. Um, Phil Papers dot org is an attempt. It's been running for a few years now, but the attempt was to be able to have like one place, like one master. Uh, searchable and like a, have a search engine that can like look over like every philosophy paper that's ever published um, and it's it started to actually be big enough and enough people are involved in it and tracking it and updating it that it's starting to become more robust but what's really cool about fill papers is that you can search by topic so you can search for business ethics and even subcategories within that like fiduciary duty you can probably find a, a subheading for that sort of thing um, that's another really good research, uh, so uh, a way to track down sources um, that are going to be quality sources here. So we're looking for like published philosophy papers. That's going to be the most important thing. Um, if you have any questions about whether something counts as a quality source or not, talk to me. I'm happy to help you sort that out. But generally, if this is a philosophy paper that's published in a philosophy journal, then that's going to work. Something from the op-ed of New York Times. Eh, maybe not. Um, there, there are some that I would be okay with because sometimes, um, sometimes things like the New York Times um, or the Wall Street Journal or something like that, they actually do bring in professional philosophers to write articles. I mean, that kind of stuff can happen. And usually they're a little more informal or it might be like an interview or something like that. But it could be substantive enough that it would count as a quality source. But really, the, the gold standard here is peer reviewed, published journal articles. That's what I want you to do. So because I'm looking for you to deal with these sources in a very robust way, I'm only requiring three. So that's a really small number of sources for a research paper. I'm, I'm not even sure if there's another class at BC that is assigning a research paper right now that requires only three sources. That's just not, not a lot. But what I'm expecting is that you're going to do something really big with them. It's not just going to be like one line of your paper where you're like, oh, and then I got this idea from this source. Done. It's going to be something more like what Larmer's up to, where he's like, hey, Duska did this whole thing. Here's what he's saying. I'm going to really address that in a robust way. Okay, so I'm like spend a bunch of time dealing with that, integrating that voice into the conversation because I think it's a valuable voice, whether it's right or wrong. Right? Maybe it's useful 
to help us to understand our opponents um, and that's why to bring it in so that's that's a vision here for what i'm the the sort of research com the formal research component to the paper project people in the chat how's this going this is actually one of the aspects of the paper that i'm the most kind of like i want to really help students make sure they've got a good idea for what i'm looking for is this coming through okay for you my canaries in the coal mine how's it going still tweeting Wonderful. Awesome. I can help you come up with 2000 words for sure. Yes, absolutely. Um, I, I've worked with students writing original philosophy papers, which, by the way, I, I wanted to say this probably at the beginning, but if if it's scary, it, like if it's intimidating to do this, um, don't feel bad about that. It's intimidating for me to do this. I mean, this writing philosophy papers is tough. It's really ambitious. Um, but with a little help and guidance, and especially planning, not trying to do it all last minute, it's very achievable. And so I've, I've worked with students many, many times on this, and like some students who are just like, uh, I, I don't think I can do this. And and some I've even had some students who are like, should I drop the class because I don't think I'm going to be able to write this paper. Um, and we've always been able to work it out and do and produce really good work, especially every time a student has been like roping me into it and discussing things with me. I've always been like that. The paper that comes out, I'm I'm proud of for the students work in it. I'm like, this was really good. Um, that's happened almost every single time. Um, so there's definitely things that we can do to help get you there. Uh, all the stuff I'm talking about in this lecture tonight might be a little intimidating because I'm like, here's what it looks like. Here's what we want to do. It's all of this stuff. It's really robust. It's asking for a lot. And you might be like, how am I going to do all this stuff? Um, but this is just setting the vision. Um, I'm hoping that having conversations with you and working with you over the next few weeks um, on maybe like a bunch of installments that we can get you there. Um, so all the more reason to be like calling me up whenever you want, texting me, working with me about it um, a as much as you're willing to talk to me about it. Um, I'm, I, can, I, can give, I think I can give a lot of support for this project. Um, I know that what I'm asking for is a big thing. And I want to be able to offer the support to back up that request, um, to give you support that matches the intensity of the of the project that I'm asking for, that I'm challenging you with. So, yeah. So uh, before we start talking about the nuts and bolts of the assignment, that it's due a week out from the end of the quarter. I need 2,000 words minimum and three research, three quality sources for the paper. All those kinds of nuts and bolts about it. We were talking about picking a topic and having it be controversial. And I gave this image, this sort of picture of like, you're an agent working on behalf of humanity to be a truth seeker on some resolving some issue of perplexity, which we're like, oh, what to do, what to do. I want to go back to that really briefly to contrast what a philosophy paper is up to from, say, some other types of paper assignments that you may be asked to do for other classes. Um, first off, this is a research paper, but a lot of times research papers are just asking you to, to like put together a bunch of sources that kind of prove that something is true. And in philosophy, it doesn't work like that. Um, like maybe, let's say you're writing a, a history paper, a, a paper for a history class. You just need to collect all the information, right? And be like, well, we've got this source here, we've got this source here. And you might, I mean, if you're doing a really good history paper, then you're doing all this theoretical analysis of it and stuff like that. But a lot of times, um, especially for an undergrad kind of paper, it's really just a matter of like lining up all of your sources of evidence and making your case. And it's kind of like this source proves that I'm right. In philosophy, it doesn't work like that. Because like I've said before, we don't take anything on authority. So you can't be like, my position is right because here's a quote from Kant that agrees with me. And Kant's a, Kant, right? He's such a big deal, or Aristotle, or John Stuart Mill, or something like that. 
that doesn't make your position any more likely to be true just because some really smart person agrees with you. Um, we always are li we're we're looking for the authority of resolving these questions that come from the ideas themselves, from the arguments themselves. It's kind of impersonal that way. People can't own ideas. Um, and we're not asking for the credibility of something to be based on the person who's offering the argument. Just the argument itself, that can speak for itself. It can exist independently. Um, so when you're bringing in sources, it's like you're bringing in ideas to the conversation, but you still need to be processing it. So it's not this totally impersonal thing of like, well, here's just the evidence, boom. Um, you have to kind of do a lot of work here to defend an answer of how are you piecing this together? What's your reasoning of why you think this issue is the right one? Um, so you bring in sources that are part of the conversation and you're thinking about this in the kind of detached thing of the ideas for everybody, but you're involved personally and it might even feel that way when you're like doing philosophy. It's like uh, many of you have been commenting in journals and reading comments and things like that um, and just conversations I've had that you think a lot of these issues in ethics are just so subjective. And it's true, it is subjective, but it might also be objective. It could be subjective and objective. Uh, we've talked about relativism a few times. Um, if you're at all like pessimistic that there isn't any answer at all that you could argue for, let's chat, because that's gonna be a major obstacle for you in doing this assignment. Uh, so we definitely should talk about that. If you're kind of like, yeah, I'm really thinking like relativism is true, then we should talk ASAP. Um, to try to figure out how are you going to approach an assignment like this. Because I don't know if you remember from our discussion of relativism, but if relativism is true, then there's no point to arguing anything. Arguments are basically worthless um, in relativism because under relativism, you're always right. There's no way you can be wrong. So if you've got those sympathies still, if you're kind of thinking back to when we talked about relativism before, if you're still feeling that way about these issues that, oh, ethics is just too subjective to be able to give answers to questions, then we should get on the we should talk on the phone and try to work that out a little bit. Um, there's definitely things I can do to help with that and think about how you're going to attack a project like this. But definitely there's room for a philosophy paper to be <clears throat> um, a little bit more like you're defending a position. So much so that a lot of times philosophers will write in a first person perspective. And you might have been told by other, especially English teachers, to not write in first person for academic writing. Um, in philosophy, there's a little bit more leeway about this. Um, sometimes it actually helps for sake of clarity to know like what's your position <clears throat> and what's your opponent's position. So you're the one with the burden of proof, right? You've, you've got a thesis you're arguing for in your paper. You've got to defend that. So you can kind of own that responsibility, even if you can't own the ideas, you can own the responsibility that you have for advancing that as an answer. And using first person is totally okay especially when you're bringing in other sources. You can be like, you know, this person says this, here's their idea, I agree or disagree with that, right? So you are kind of doing something that's a little more personal. So kind of on the one hand, you've got this uh, research paper that's just a matter of like presenting evidence and, and it, the subjectivity is like not a part of it, but philosophy is not like that. On the other end though, going in the other direction would be something like an opinion paper or a persuasive essay, English uh, instructors sometimes talk about this, um, uh, where it's just the whole purpose of the assignment is just to present your opinion on things, um, which basically means that if you write anything and it's what you believe, success, right? So that's kind of on the other end of the spectrum. I was just saying how this is a little different than maybe other kinds of research papers that you write because you have to kind of get into the mess a little bit more. You're going to be defending a position. It's There's this room of like subjective creativity of like what you're arguing for, right? It's not just like, here are the facts kind of thing, especially in ethics. But then on the other end of the spectrum, it's not so much it's just sort of like your paper project is purely a matter of just articulating your view. Um, and this is where that image of being an agent on behalf of humanity really comes up. Because this isn't just like, well, it's just me. Like, here's the answer I've chosen for myself or the perspective I choose to adopt. It's like, you have to argue for it. Why do you think that those beliefs and values that you have or your analysis of this issue or your answer to the resolving this controversy is the best one, the one that's most rationally defensible? So you still have to back it up with argument, and that's where it gets back into the realm of the impersonal. This isn't just a subjective report about your perspective. 
but it's trying to actually argue for it. If someone disagreed with your position, if they didn't share your beliefs, why do you think that they should? And that might feel a little weird. That might it might even for some of you have reactions of like, Ugh, like that's kind of arrogant. Like who am I to tell other people what they should believe, right? But that's where this image of like, you're providing a service to people. Like here's a question. When you think about this question, here are things that are relevant in that debate. And here's my best construction about how to piece it all together to actually give an answer. So you're kind of, um, you're being ambitious to try to answer a question in a way that like takes stock of everything, all things considered, all the possible concerns that people with different perspectives have on that issue and sorting it out. Like, but at the end of the day, you have to make choices. You can't believe in everything. And that's why um, also part of the description here about the paper is that, uh, and what I'm asking you to do in this assignment, is it can't just be a matter of presenting all the different options. Um, you have to argue for a position. I'm requiring you to have a thesis. Um, so like I say here uh, in the uh, instructions and grading for the paper, you have a clearly defined position or thesis you will be defending with arguments. In other words, this paper is not supposed to be a survey of all the different positions and arguments in the debate told in the perspective of an impartial observer. Will you do that? Yes. In the sense that I say a couple bullet points later, you need to engage with opposing perspectives. But you're going to be doing it argumentatively. I've, I've had many students who write philosophy papers for me in the past that are sort of like, they've, they've got a really good start. It's doing everything I'm asking for, right? They've got a controversial question. Um, it's not It's a rational controversy. It's not clear. Like all these positions have something good to say for themselves. But throughout the whole paper, they are completely noncommittal about it. They're like, well, there's some people who believe this. And here are all the reasons why they think they're right. And then there's these people over here. And they believe this. And here's all the reasons why they think they're right. Here's what the sides say to each other. How they get into a fight about this. Done. The end. And that is not going to be acceptable for this assignment. Um, you're not writing a Wikipedia article or even like a, a Stanford encyclopedia article of like, here's the state of the debate, like just to inform you about what's going on in the debate. I want you to actually step into the risky territory of trying to actually answer this. And you might feel really... Um, maybe like a lot of modesty about that. Maybe some of you are, are will, will be fine with, I mean, everyone's different kind of a, how they experience this, but I definitely anticipate that some of you might feel like, I don't really know. I mean, this is a whole new world for me. I haven't done philosophy before. Thinking about business ethics might even be a topic that I haven't really considered that much. Um, I don't feel like I'm an authority, that I'm someone who could step forward and be like, hey, humanity, I've got some ideas about this question that you're wondering about. You should listen to what I have to say. Like maybe it's like, ooh, no, I'm not ready to do that, and I'm I'd be like, that makes sense, and that's fine. I don't think I I wouldn't say you shouldn't feel that way or something like that, um, but I still want you to take a stab at it anyway, so you can kind of think about it like, um, like again when I gave this image of you're an agent on behalf of all of humanity trying to answer a perplexing question, kind of think about it like, um, you're gonna spend time working on it. You're just gonna like wrestle with the question, wrestle with the arguments. And then report to us your accomplishments. And that's your paper. Your best shot for now. With all the things that you considered, you're kind of like, here's what I was thinking about. And what you're thinking about are the uh, arguments in defense of your thesis and the possible objections and how to respond to those objections. I mean, that's all the content of your like efforts to try to track what's of concern in this debate, in this territory of whatever particular controversy you've selected for yourself. So... Um, don't feel like you have to adopt an arrogant tone. I'm definitely not asking for that. What I am asking you to do, though, is step out, be vulnerable, take a stand on your issue, and and try to defend it. Um, and you might feel kind of like, oh, I don't know if I've done a good job defending this against all the possible objections and things like that. That's okay. That's absolutely okay. Um, definitely good philosophical work doesn't mean posturing like you have all the answers. Um, some of my favorite philosophical works, and the ones I thought that were like really did something really important, the philosopher might end it being like, here's all the things that I think I haven't done. Like, I've been able to do this, I think, but I don't think I've been able to do this. This is work that's left to be done that hasn't I, I wasn't able to do here. I'm sorry. <laughs> kind of like, um, here's what I got. Uh, I really like um, Wittgenstein comes to mind as a good example of this. Uh, Wittgenstein has a book called Philosophical Investigations, which was one of his, probably was like the biggest major work of his life. 
and uh, in the preface to it, he says, basically, I've been working a long time on these ideas, and I always hoped to have like a nice, clear theory that was well organized and had all my thoughts organized and I'd solved all these problems. And he's like, I haven't been able to do that. So what you're about to read is just like my best thoughts. Like here's a bunch of thoughts I have. I don't have a very clear position. I don't have a clear theory that sorts everything out. But I think this is valuable. I think it's contributing something to our discussions about these questions. So here's what I got. Now, I, I don't want you to use Wittgenstein as an excuse for turning in a really sloppy paper for me. Um, but this kind of demonstration uh, of like modesty about the what work you've been able to do is totally OK. You don't have to pretend like you have all the answers for this. Um, but I do want you to take the risk and step into the game. So. Writing in terms of locating, like attacking this assignment, trying to feel out what it's going to be like to write a philosophy paper. Philosophy papers sit in this really weird in between land between a research paper that's just a matter of presenting the facts. It's not a matter of like subjectivity or room for any kind of like personal, cre rational creativity or something like that. And on the other hand, a paper that's just about your opinion and nothing more. It's sort of in between this. You have to bring yourself to the table and kind of own up to your assumptions and what you, why you've got the perspective that you do. But you're also trying to argue for it in the arena of what everyone is thinking, like to resolve the things that we disagree about, where we do take different perspectives and trying to figure out, yeah, which of these things makes the most sense. Like if I have a choice to make and you do have a choice to make about what you believe and there's all these options here and there's these different things recommending it. What's going to be the deal maker and the deal breaker for why you would choose one of those answers over another? Okay. All right. So hopefully that's helping with fleshing out the vision here. Um, I want to, hmm, what do we want to do next here? Um, oh, yeah, some other points here from my instructions and grading for paper document uh, that we haven't touched on yet. Since I've, I've already touched on a lot of these, let's just knock out the other ones. I am going to be asking that you're, in terms of objectives for the paper, I want to see that it shows evidence of editing and organization so you didn't just barf this out last minute. Um, I'll talk more about what that might look like in the other document, the writing for philosophy and, and the sort of step-by-step -step procedure I'm, I'm offering there uh, as some guidance. Um, I say this is a very important point. I will not be grading you on the basis of how effective I think your arguments are, or in other words, whether I agree with you. Whether, I think you, whether you've been able to convince me that your answer is right is not how I'm going to be grading you. I actually was just on the phone with some old students over the last few weeks who have transferred to other schools and are part of philosophy programs, and they were just like floored by how some, some philosophy professors that they had at these departments really were operating that way, that they like had a particular philosophical perspective, and if their students weren't in agreement with it, then they're... They're, they, they lost points, like they were graded poorly for that, whereas the students who did agree with the positions of the instructor uh, got better grades. I think that's professionally unethical, um, personally. I'm like, that is just wrong. That's just, just absolutely wrong um, <laughs> for so many reasons. I won't get into a big lecture about why I think it's so wrong, but I just want to let you know I am not a, a professor who operates that way, and I try really hard to keep a check on that. Um, whether I agree with you or disagree with you is not going to be a factor here of uh, whether you, you're going to get a grade. The main thing that I'm looking to have you do, I, I'll, I'll be totally honest about it, a lot of the grading criteria here is just like um, getting involved in the process of doing this. I know that for most of you this is your first philosophy class, and this is probably going to be your first philosophy paper. Maybe for some of you it isn't, um, and so this is already kind of familiar territory for you. But um, I know for a lot of you it isn't, and just showing up and, and trying to do this ambitious thing that can be very intimidating is really what I'm asking for. Be a part of the process. Give it a give it a old like the way people say, give it an old college try. Like really like take a risk with yourself. Um, try doing something different, uh, and and really do it in a give it a really good shot. And what does that mean? Well, it means like taking seriously the advice that I've got, um, and the guidance about like how deep uh, and how seriously to take the assignment, how how it would look to take it seriously, um, that kind of stuff. So like I say. Um, 
this doesn't mean uh oh all right sorry for that interruption my um neighbor's wi-fi that i set up so that we'd have a more reliable internet connection just like shut down randomly and uh, i had trouble reconnecting um okay but uh what i was talking about before it cut out <laughs> was uh maybe the last thing you saw in the video was uh oh <laughs> um uh, the last thing I was talking about, I think, was about how I'm not going to grade you based on whether I agree with you. And I'm asking you to just be kind of like involved in this process. Um, that's that's the really major thing. Okay. And I try to spell out here in this document instructions and grading for paper, the grading criteria that I'm going to be using, exactly how I'm going to be looking at your paper and how I'm, what sort of informing my choice about what letter grade to assign to it. If you have any questions about my grading, I want you to talk to me about it. I, I don't want this to be a guessing game of what is Tim looking for. I've had classes with instructors where it definitely felt like that was happening, where I was like, what are you, what are you asking for? What do you want me to do, right? So that's what this, I mean, that's what the whole lecture tonight is really for, is to try to spell that all out uh, for you. But also to, um, I, I'm interested in going further on that too. If there's anything I could do to clarify that more, if you don't feel like you have a good idea of where's the bar being set or like what are the standards that are going to be used to evaluate your work, I'm really happy to be completely transparent about that as much as I can. I've made an attempt here in this document to kind of lay it all out there for you, um, but uh, if that doesn't do the trick, I'm happy to do more too, so definitely talk to me about it. Uh, okay, a lot of the things that are going to come up here though are things that show up in my Writing for Philosophy document. And now I want to kind of turn over back to that um, and walk you through the process a little bit more. So I, I wrote this document for my 101 students to try to give them some structured guidance about how to attack this. And I'm sort of trying to be kind of like a step-by-step -step sort of thing. So um, the first thing is picking a topic, making sure you're addressing something of rational controversy. Um, that's the really crucial, crucial thing. Um, and then there's this part about identifying a thesis. And this is what I was talking about a couple minutes ago where I was like, uh, you're going to have to defend a position. You're going to have to take a stance. You'll have to say, here's the question that I'm addressing, but here's my answer to that question. So your, your thesis, you're probably familiar with hearing about like writing, having a thesis for your paper for other paper assignments. I don't, I don't think that's a, probably a new thing for writing a philosophy paper. Um, but the key thing here about your thesis is not like here's the theme that I want to talk about, but your thesis is really like a specific claim that the entire purpose of the paper is to defend that claim, to try to prove that that's true. So anything that you're talking about in the paper should be about like, is this thing true or is it not true? So for example, uh, Deska, his thesis is that uh, companies are most of the time not proper objects of loyalty. That's his thesis. Everything that that paper revolves around is a matter of addressing whether or not that's true or false. So he looks at opposing perspectives on loyalty and different things that people might say um, that he doesn't agree with, but are definitely the kinds of considerations that if they were true, that might cast some skeptical light on accepting Deska's thesis. And then of course he's presenting a bunch of arguments for why he thinks that conclusion would be justified. That's the same thing you're gonna have to do. And this is actually a constraint that I think is going to serve you and help you. Your thesis is kind of like the linchpin. Um, here, I'm going to put the mic down for a second. Um, <clears throat> I think writing a philosophy paper is a lot like this hourglass sort of thing. So you've got kind of this widening and then a narrowing, narrowing, and then a, a widening out from there. And what is it that's happening in this sort of framework? Well, I think at the beginning, your initial brainstorming might just be like, what's the theme? that I'm interested in writing on. Maybe company loyalty, employee loyalty, maybe that. But then you wanna narrow it down more to a particular controversy, like a question. Like, is a company a proper object of loyalty? Or maybe something like, if there is loyalty to a company, how much is it worth, right? Or, or something, right? You just narrow it down a little bit more to a more specific question that we could have different answers about, or that there could be rational disagreement over. And then you narrow it down to this very particular point, your thesis, which is an answer to that question. So you've got like the, the controversy, and then what's your stance on that controversy? And that's this focus point. And then from that focus point of like the thesis that you're trying to defend in your paper comes all the rest of your brainstorming that just explodes from there in terms of 
what are what are reasons for thinking your thesis is right what are reasons for thinking your thesis is wrong those are that's what all the rest of it is going to be about um, another metaphor that I'm really fond of here about the importance of a thesis and picking it right and there's definitely an art to this and I can help you a lot with picking picking the right kind of thesis not too much not too little is this sort of thing um, you, you you there's kind of um, oh, okay let me give you the metaphor first um, think about a lighthouse in a swamp so this isn't a lighthouse on like the beach with the ocean or something like that but just take a lighthouse and then plant plant it right in the middle of a swamp and the lighthouse is basically your thesis as you're like maybe brainstorming and thinking about different ethical arguments and issues and concerns and all this sort of stuff all the all the various morally relevant features that might be that might make this so messy that's why I like the swamp metaphor right you're getting stuck in the weeds right you can always think about getting some direction on how to actually write your paper and what to talk about and how to talk about it by thinking about what am I thinking about right now how does that pertain to my thesis you know like the lighthouse is like over there right it's always from wherever whatever part of the swamp that you're in the lighthouse is this like shining beacon that gives you direction and helps you orient and if you can't make a connection between this thing that you might want to talk about in your paper and how that has any bearing on your thesis, it's probably irrelevant and you shouldn't talk about it. It might be important. It might be interesting. It, it might be intriguing for reflection, but maybe not for this paper. Maybe for some other paper. Maybe it's a relevant consideration for some other topic. Um, uh, you might be familiar with this, like uh, um, maybe having a philosophical type discussion with like a friend where you're like, you're like doing this kind of open truth seeking sort of thing or exploring disagreement and maybe it feels like the conversation is really unproductive because you just go from one tangent to another I've had many students report this about philosophy they're like they never solve anything you just go around in circles all the time um, and it might just be because the people in that debate are not being as disciplined as they should be there it's definitely possible to have a more focused discussion and debate where you like stick to like okay let's debate this issue like this particular claim this thesis is it right or wrong and you're talking about this and they're like oh that makes me think about this that makes me think about this that makes me think about this maybe at a certain point where we've drifted far enough out of the swamp that it's not in the perimeter of what the light from the lighthouse is illuminating sort of you can imagine the lighthouse like shining down an area that it illuminates and anything that's in that territory might be relevant to the lighthouse but anything that's outside of that maybe not maybe not so you have to make that kind of judgment call as well um, so the thesis is it will kind of keep you oriented and it'll help you to organize your thoughts and a lot of times when I'm doing philosophical brainstorming I'm like my intuitions my nose kind of gets out ahead of my thoughts of <laughs> my reason I'm like Ooh, I think there's something over there but I'm like how is it connected I'm not, maybe, maybe not sure and if I just start talking about it without any plan or intention or especially argumentative intention then that's not very helpful like just collecting a bunch of thoughts in the paper kind of like Wittgenstein did is maybe not the most helpful thing in the world and that's why people are like Wittgenstein you should have been a better writer but you're so smart and clever we'll forgive you <laughs> that's kind of Wittgenstein story um, but we want to try to be better than that. Wittgenstein tried to be better than that, too. He just failed. Um, but he recognized the value of it. I want you to shoot for that. Don't just start throwing out anything that your mind cooks up, but really think about touching it to your thesis, connecting it, tethering it to your thesis. Um, this is getting a little bit ahead of myself, but when it actually comes down to composing the paper and you're actually writing the draft, I definitely advise you to do a pass of editing well actually okay so in this there's a pass here for editing on um, filling gaps and clarity and when you're editing your work uh, in the paper for clarity be thinking about um, like really spelling it out maybe in a way that sounds annoying and obnoxious and robotic spell out for your reader when you're making some kind of point tell us why you think that point matters like make connect the dots for us even if it feels like it's duh anyone can figure this out do it anyway and I think that'll really help if you know the purpose of every paragraph in your paper and how it pertains to the defense of your thesis that's a good sign if you're not sure then that's something to think about more and maybe give some help to your reader about connecting those dots too
Okay. Final big thing I'd want to talk about here about the art of crafting a thesis. Again, something that I can help you a lot when we talk about your paper topic. Um, is there's a, a problem with making it too big or too small. Um, oh, I just got a warning from Skype. Everyone in the chat, can you still hear me? Am I still connected? Yes, okay, good. Phew. The ghosts and the machine are out tonight and giving me trouble. Okay, um, so the bigger your thesis, like the stronger of a claim you're making, the more burden of proof you have. It's kind of like making a bigger lighthouse. It's going to shine and cast a bigger light area that it illuminates, right? So you're going to have a lot more territory you have to cover. If your thesis is smaller, then you don't have as much burden of proof. But if it's too small, then it's trivial. You're like not saying something significant. So catching that just right, like trying to avoid these two extremes of biting off more than you can chew or not saying enough that's interesting or robust enough, like substantive enough, that's the kind of balancing act of picking a good thesis. And it can be really hard to decide. It's kind of, um, I, I sometimes use this metaphor of it's like going to old country buffet or like going, going to any of these like, or uh, Mongolian grill. I have this experience at Mongolian grill too. Um, where you're like loading up your plate with all this food. She's like, ooh, this is good, and this is good, and this is good. And then you're like, I'm never going to be able to eat all this food. Um, but also you might like, you're like worried about not having enough, right? Like I make too small of a bowl, and I'm going to have to go back and forth and I get some more later. It, it is this kind of Goldilocks problem, and you have to know yourself. You have to know how much food do I actually need? What's the right amount? I don't want to be gorging myself, and I don't want to be starving. Um, and that takes a little bit of experience sometimes. So again, if this is your first time doing a philosophy paper, sometimes it can be hard to know whether you're biting off more than you can chew. I can help you with that a lot um, in sort of catching it just right. And if a lot of times what I can do in sort of talking with you about your ideas is get a sense for what interests you and where what your sort of philosophical ambitions are and figure out a way to kind of like tailor that um, to something that's manageable, something that you can address. Um, so I can help with that. Definitely another reason to talk to me. Okay, so that's the thesis thing. <clears throat> As I talked about before, you may not know what your thesis is going into this. Um, it might be something that em emerges later. But either way, whether you start knowing your, your conclusion or it's going to sort of emerge through brainstorming, brainstorming is the next thing. And I have it listed in the guide as these sets of passes. The first pass is like just general brainstorming, the kind of thing I described earlier of the like, just what matters in this debate? What are the different considerations? For my side, for my opponent, if I'm not aligned, for the different perspectives that are possible, the different possible answers, just kind of getting a sense of the lay of the land. And then all the other steps I've got below here are like editing steps of like going through that initial brainstorming, looking for something different to try to target and deal with. Um, and so I want to kind of describe those a little bit. But the first point here is definitely that in my experience, um, especially before I wrote this guide and like made a specific point about it to my students, that a lot of times people just stop at the first pass. They do their initial brainstorming, write the paper with those ideas, and call it good. And that's it. Like I said earlier, <clears throat> editing is so important for doing like decent philosophical work. Um, and there's a lot of... Uh, you just catch things by looking over it and looking at, over it for different things. Um, and I do kind of... I, I, I would imagine doing this in this kind of deliberate way. <clears throat> Maybe you write a detailed outline. Get, collect all your thoughts. Make a plan. Mull on it, you know, doing all this reflective thinking, writing notes down here and there. But then at some point, you, like, put it all together. And you make a master list of all this stuff. And, and maybe it's a brief outline that you do for yourself. Uh, if you want me to look at outlines or drafts or something, I'd be happy to do that. Just let me know. And then you review it and you might go through it like go through everything looking for one thing and then you know put on a different set of glasses different lens go through it again looking for something different and I think these passes you could really do them mechanically and that would work really good you could also do it less mechanically and just be like these are all factors I, I'm trying to be sensitive to and balls I'm trying to juggle but if you want to really do it step by step like this that's great um, the one thing I do want to make clear, because <clears throat> sometimes this has not been clear in the past with students, um, 
I am not, I want to be really clear on this, these different steps or passes are not different sections of your paper. These are editing passes of like revising the ideas. Um, if you're looking for a basic model for a philosophy paper, um, well, the first thing I'll say is this. When it comes to organization, there's a lot of ways to skin the cat here, and philosophers are really open to that. Um, there's a lot of room for variations in style and approach to writing a philosophy paper and doing good philosophical work. And I don't want, I'm, I've tried to, when I composed this document, I didn't want to pr present this like really rigid rubric or like it has to look like this kind of thing. You'll notice all the different bits of advice that I have in here. Like there's a lot of ways that you could do this. You could write the paper in a lot of different styles and just accomplish these things. This is This is my best attempt to try to figure out what are the sort of universal things that we always care about for good philosophical work? But how you do that, like how you execute on that, can look wildly different. And people have their own philosophical voice to find, kind of like poetry, like finding your own poetry voice. I think I described that earlier when I went through the syllabus at the beginning of the quarter, like how to write. You'll find that. Um, and I don't, I don't have the one way that everyone needs to do it. But there are some things we care about. We care about clarity. We care about how you're engaging with your opponent. Um, we care about what what are the standards for making good arguments. There are some rational standards to this. I, I teach uh, formal and informal logic classes to discuss all those kinds of standards of what makes an argument stronger or weaker. Um, and there are things here to be sensitive to. Um, so uh, the, there's there you might have a lot of questions about whether what you're doing sort of fits. But here is a basic model that you can follow. Um, intro paragraph. Intro, the purpose of an intro paragraph in a philosophy paper is to do very specific things. Introduce the topic, like what's the subject that you're discussing. Define the controversy or the question that you're going to be addressing. Again, doing this pretty short. It doesn't have to be paragraphs along here. We want to get to, we've got to jump to the chase as quickly as we can. Indicate what your thesis is. You don't want this to be a surprise later on in the paper. You want to go out right away and be like, here's what I'm going to try to do in this paper. I'm going to try to defend this position. This is my answer. This is my thesis claim. Everything's going to be about defending that. And then if you're going to do anything else in the intro paragraph, it would be to give a brief description of your game plan argumentatively. Like, what's your strategy? How are you going to try to defend that? What's going to happen in the paper that follows? That's what your intro paragraph should be. And then as you get into the paper proper, you might have a short section, emphasis on short, very, very short, of sort of setting the stage, being like, Here's the things that are going on in this debate, or here are some ideas that are relevant. A good example is going back to Deska. Deska wants to talk about employee loyalty, so he sets the stage with like, here's how you can think about loyalty generally. There's this idealism thing, the social atomism thing, and then there's this moderate position. So now you know the players in the game kind of thing. You might do that. You might need to set some things up in order for your arguments to make sense. But you want to keep this as minimal as possible. In my experience, this is the part where uh, the paper where students usually get a little uh, overzealous with it, and then there's not a lot of space left over for the arguments. Um, presenting all the facts of a scenario, don't belabor that too much, right? Um, the key thing is to get into the arguments as quickly as possible. And that's going to be the main body of your paper. Um, most of your paper should be spent with the arguments you're using to defend your thesis, the arguments of your opponents about how they're going to try to challenge your position, and your responses to that. And that's what these other uh, passes are really looking for. So what I call the second pass is really about clarity of like, how could someone who disagrees with you understand your side of it? Uh, sometimes you take things for granted about your own perspective, like underlying unspoken assumptions, we might say biases, things like that. You want to make it really clear and easy to your reader to understand what's going on here. So you might need to fill in some gaps between the premises, the reasons you're providing in your arguments, and your thesis, your conclusion. And then I talk about this next pass about validity, sufficiency, and then this thing I call soundness. What these things are really referring to are the two basic standards for having a good argument. So if you're going to make a case for anything, you're going to have premises, and your conclusion. So your thesis is your ultimate conclusion, and then you've got these remarks or observations or considerations for why, you're, why we should think your conclusion is right. There's always two ways to object to an argument. 
you could either dispute the truth of the of the premises or argue that even if the premises are true they're not enough to justify the conclusion that there's like a leap in logic here um so uh maybe larmer might say something like just because um there's loyalty to the company doesn't mean that whistleblowing is wrong right so he might disagree with that classic argument that says well whistleblowing is prima facie wrong because it's a disloyal act Okay, so because it's a disloyal act, uh, uh, therefore, uh, well, actually, no, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm getting a little confused here. Okay, <laughs> this is why it's sometimes good to plan things out and, like, organize your own thoughts. So if the standard argument is whistleblowing is prima facie morally problematic, why? Because it's an act of disloyalty, then both Duska and Larmer think that premise is false. Whistleblowing is not disloyal. But they think about it for different reasons. So Duska is saying, because uh, uh, businesses aren't proper objects of loyalty at all, whistleblowing can't be a disloyal act. And Larmer's sort of like, you know, there's not that's not the only thing that could be going on here. And you could accept the premise that um, whistleblowing actually is a uh, has to do with loyal that bi that businesses are proper objects of loyalty without thinking that whistleblowing is morally problematic as a disloyal act. Okay, so actually, yeah. See, organizing your thoughts can be difficult. I always say articulation is half the battle with philosophy. Sorry about this. Um, this might be actually a better way to frame it. I'm trying to come up with a good example here. Let's say, uh, okay, here we go. Ah, this is, I think this is what I had in mind initially, tracking down my own intuitions. Let's have the standard argument be like this. Um, employees have a duty of loyalty to the company, to their employer. Therefore, whistleblowing is prima facie wrong as a disloyal act. Okay, so that's what Larmer would say doesn't follow. He's like, I agree with the premise. Employees do can have loyalty to their employer, but that doesn't mean that whistleblowing is a disloyal act and is morally problematic as a result. And why? Because, well, Larmer gives his own arguments for why. But if he's looking at that kind of standard argument, He's doing this first thing of like, even though I agree with the premises being true, I disagree with the conclusion. I agree with you, standard model, that employees have loyalty to the employer, but I disagree that that means that whistleblowing is morally problematic as a disloyal act. Okay, so that's always one way you can attack an argument, and the other way is to dispute the truth of the premises. So um, that's what Duska does, right? He takes the standard argument and just says, yeah, that's not true. There isn't a bond of loyalty between the employer, employee and the employer. Um, or at least if there is, that wouldn't be appropriate. Okay, So he disagrees with that. Um, so that can happen with your own arguments. When you're looking at the kinds of things that you have as reasons for your position, think about them in the context of, could someone challenge my assumptions and premises of whether they're even true at all? Do, is there any risk there? And is there a risk with them saying, I grant all of that? Or even for the sake of argument, like I grant that for the sake of argument, I don't think that's enough. That's not sufficient to prove that your conclusion or your thesis is true. You want to look for both kinds of objections, and they they kind of require looking in a different way at at your arguments in this kind of critical self-examination. If you want to talk more with me about that, please do, and take a look at this document. Of course, read it for yourself. I think I can help here. And then I talk about perspective. Um, and actually, I kind of want to do a little drawing and paint. Um, I find this, uh, I, I've, I've uh, over the years sort of developed this little diagram that I think is really, really helpful uh, with students looking for what more to talk about um, and how to get with your opponents. So get into conversation with your opponents. I'm going to, on the chat here, I'm going to try to share the window. Let's see here. Where is it? Uh, here we go. So all of you, can you see um, my uh, paint document here? I'm going to draw some circles in it. Can you see those circles? No. Okay. Current. No? Hmm. Oh, there it is. Awesome. Cool. Wonderful. So here we've got uh, you and your opponent. 
So uh, you and your opponent, you know, you disagree. So your positions are in conflict. Whatever is your thesis, that's your position that defines your position. The antithesis, the antithesis, that defines your opponent's position. The first thing is, like, if you're just wondering who your opponents are, your opponents are anyone who disagrees with your thesis, who would take issue with that. Um, they may not be the most extreme version of that disagreement. They could actually be a little closer to home. Um, but uh, they're anyone who ultimately would disagree with your thesis. Now, when you're thinking about this, um, you can imagine uh, sort of possible reasons that support your position. These would be like positive advantages of your position, things that recommend it. Things that you want to say, hey, my position's doing pretty good. And um, so you might, you're, you're giving these arguments in support of your position. If you want to think about where there could be objections, one source of objection would be, here, let's pull up a brush here. Um, your opponent could try to say, hey, I want to challenge. I want to challenge this. I'm going to try to problematize this. Those things that you think are pluses to your position, maybe they don't. They're, so the opponent might try to undercut that. And they can do this in two ways. They can try to say uh, the premises of your argument are false, or they could try to go after... Um, this support relation. They might say, yeah, you've got some good points here, but that's not enough to justify your thesis. All right, so that's your position down there. So if you want to try to defend against those objections, you might try to block them. All right, try to say, yeah, there are these concerns. I've got them drawn here as these kind of messy things, but I can block those concerns. Okay, so your opponent might go after you there. But there's other places to go looking for arguments. We also might be worried about any possible uh, sort of disadvantages, some negative things about your position that your opponent might try to saddle you with, and you're going to try to say, nope, these things are not actual deficiencies. Or maybe if they're deficiencies, they're not serious enough to undermine your position as being the most rationally defensible position on the issue. So that's all well and good. This is this is kind of brainstorming for arguments and objections that have to do with you and your thesis, or the focus is around, around your thesis and what's going on here with you. In this part of uh, the writing guide where I talk about this pass for perspective, that's kind of like thinking about all the rest of this. Um, so actually, let me do um, solid color. Let's do this. Oh, no, I didn't want that to happen. Um, can I make this, uh, uh, oh, well, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, this isn't Photoshop. I can't do super cool things. So, uh, just forget about that. Uh, <laughs> let's do, here, we'll do this. Ah, no, um, Phil, no Phil. There we go. Here we go. So this pass about perspective is kind of thinking about what's going on in your opponent's side of this game like getting inside their head, playing on their home turf. And so you might try to think about what are the things that they might say to defend their position? What are the advantages that they might appeal to where you would do the same thing? You're going to try to be like, oh, no, this isn't, this doesn't make sense. Uh, it has false premises or the support relation doesn't follow. Even if these things are true, that doesn't mean the opponent's position is true. You might go after him that way, and you might try to go after here, trying to show that the uh, opponent's got these negative things going on with their position that are problematic, okay? So deficiencies or concerns about adopting their stance on it. So this whole, this whole pass about perspective is like looking at things from your opponent's perspective. I'm trying to see, like, if you're coming up short on terms of content, like we were talking about, how do you get to the 2,000 word count? Um, what can you do to help with that? These are definitely places you can go looking for more things to add into the conversation and the debate. There's advantages to your position, disadvantages, arguments in favor of your opponent's position, and possible concerns about it. Um, this might sound like pro-con lists, and I kind of want to say something about that. So I don't think it is. Um, I'm going to stop sharing here. Um, 
Okay, so back, you can see my video again, everyone. Yeah? No? Eh. Yes, okay, cool. Um, so this isn't a pro-con list. Um, I, I wanted to talk about this sooner or later. Definitely, I highly, highly, highly discourage you writing your paper in terms of just a pro-con list. Um, why? Well, pro-con lists are really ham-fisted most of the time, and they don't really offer a lot of help or insight in terms of how to resolve a debate. Okay, so remember, that's your job in this paper. You're an agent on behalf of humanity. You're going to be a truth seeker trying to figure out what is the best way to resolve a controversy. When you just look at a pro-con, you're like, well, there's this, but there's this. I mean, ooh, what's next, you know? Um, a really good example of this would actually be um, Hedinger, which we're going to talk, and Pochman. We're going to talk about them on um, on Thursday. And what they're doing might look like a pro-con list to you, but they're not really pros and cons. They're like, here's an argument. Here's an argument that would justify taking this stance. Here's how I can deal with that argument. Or here's why it's a bad argument, or something like that. They might try to defend it this way. I can block them there too. And you want to go through as many arguments as possible, not just like, here are these considerations. Um, what are the reasons that someone might think this position is just false, like a weakness to the position? And what, you, what can there be a response to that sort of thing? So sometimes if you're thinking the whole time about your perspective and defending your thesis, you might have some blind spots in the debate, and this perspective pass helps you fill that in. It's like trying to put yourself in your opponent's shoes. This is like heavy charity. Um, be like, why would my opponent's position even possibly make sense? And again, if you can't give any answer to that question, you probably have too trivial of a thesis. You're not doing something that's of actual rational controversy. You might need to go a little bit back to the drawing board on that in terms of just how you're conceiving of your paper overall. Um, but definitely you want to be thinking about things from your opponent's perspective. And then only after all of this do I kind of talk about organization. Um, this is the sort of final thing about how to collect all of your thoughts and put them into a paper that's really going to make sense to your reader. Um, there's, like I mentioned, this kind of outline of a philosophy paper, intro, setup, stage setting, and then the meat. And there's a lot of ways to handle the meat. Um, here, I'll just give you some examples. One thing you might do is lay out all of your arguments for your position and then have a section where you entertain objections and then give replies to those objections so you might break it down like that but you also might break it down like here's an argument here's a, re a possible objection about that argument and here's my reply and then next here's another argument here's a possible objection here's a reply you might break it down something like that where it's a little bit more like you going in this back and forth conversation with your opponent throughout the whole paper rather than saving all those concerns from your opponent to like the end of the paper you see people doing things in different ways and which what choice what structural choice makes sense for your paper that's going to really depend on a lot of contextual factors in this part of the writing for philosophy document i've sort of listed some of the variables that might inform your choices about organization there is no way that you're going to be able to do all of them. <laughs> so it's kind of like a judgment call to figure out which ones might be the most important. And that's another thing I'd be happy to give you some feedback and advice about, too. I, I think I can help with some guidance there. But um, organization is uh, – sometimes I, when working with students on writing papers, the organization is sort of like getting the cart before the horse. It's like you don't know what's going to be the right way to structure the paper until you know what you have to say. Don't use structure as a way to figure out what you're going to say. <laughs> Let it be messy first. Just think about like, it's like a sincere reflection on your issue and topic. Be like, what matters here? What do I think, what are the reactions I've got? What are the things other people are concerned about that I should be sensitive to? If it's a concern for them, maybe it's a concern for me. Or at least something i got to take seriously. Um, and then go from there. And then let the structure sort of emerge at the end. Um, once you've kind of got a lay of the land. It's gonna. The trailblazing is always messier than the planning uh, it all out at the end, the final polished product kind of thing. So I think it is right to sort of save that toward the end. Um, okay. Uh, another little, I, and we're kind of coming up here on as long as I wanted to make this video because I could talk about this stuff for forever. 
Um, and I'm very happy to talk with all of you more about this. Hopefully you're getting a good vision here for what I'm looking for. Um, but I've got two more things that I want, I planned in my head that I wanted to talk about in this lecture. Um, one of them's on audience, and another one, I wanted to kind of give you some closing remarks here that are uh, really specifically about, okay, how do I get started? Where am I going to go? Um, like after all this big picture talking, like how do I actually going to do this practically? So I've got some closing remarks on that. Oh, I'm happy I got to the pause button for the video. For everyone in the chat, my apologies because I couldn't, I didn't get, I didn't have the mute button accessible. Um, the the first thing of, of these two is about audience. And um, a lot of times, especially if you've taken English classes re requiring you to write papers and stuff, they'll say like you got to know your audience. You got to know what are you, who are you addressing, to set the tone and the style for your writing. You want to pick the right kind of way of approaching things depending on who your audience is. So there might be a question here. You might be used to writing in this way. Uh, many people I've talked to are like, yeah, if I'm able to like visualize an audience, it becomes much easier for me to find the words and find a way to articulate my thoughts and get it out there. So I don't think you, you, it's necessary to think about an audience um, for philosophy. But if you are going to do it, I've got some um, ideas about how you might do this. Uh, the example I use here is not going to be familiar to you because... This is from my 101 class, so so don't worry about that. Um, but this this might still be useful to you. This this should apply. Um, if you are going to imagine an audience, imagine someone. This is how I'm going to try to be as your audience when I'm grading it. Um, someone who is listening, who wants to hear what you have to say, who's like, I'm open. Give me give me what you got. Like I'm curious. What are your thoughts? I'm I'm not I'm not going to be like. Hmm, hmm. Am I, is this a waste of my time or not? Or something like that. Someone who's like really curious and uh, invested and open, right? Open-minded, we might say. Again, thinking about the code of intellectual conduct and how we described being open-minded there. Um, they're, they're, they want to hear what you got. They want to be like, yeah, I'm interested to get some more voices into this discussion. And, and maybe you've got something I haven't thought of before, this kind of thing. So imagine someone who's like enthusiastically supportive to hear what, they, what you have to say but who is also critical. So those kind of two components, right? Someone who's going to be charitable, who's looking to understand you, not looking to dismiss you, but also who's not just going to like accept anything you have to say rolling over. They're going to like investigate and be like, does that really make sense? I'm, I'm curious to know what you are trying to say, but then also be like, do I agree? You know, someone who's going to have that critical component. I think a lot of times when we're imagining an audience and just how people are, is it's kind of like one extreme or the other. Right, either someone who's just like drinking the Kool Aid that you're drinking, and you're like totally bro, like on the same page, right? Who's just like uh, they're enthusiastic about what you have to say because they agree with it, right? Or 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 they just accept whatever they what you have to say, being like, oh yeah, ooh, kind of like they they they're not very critical, right? But supportive. Or on the other end, someone who's critical and not supportive, who's not open who's not interested in what you're having to say or looking for how it might make sense to like interpret you charitably. They're just like looking to shoot you down the whole time. Both of those audiences, I think, are not good audiences to think about. Uh, if you're always thinking about the person who's going to shoot you down, then there's a tendency to be combative and overly defensive and to have this kind of like acidic tone of, of just like counter punching before there even is a punch thrown your way. Like, a kind of a preemptive strike, so to so so to speak. Um, and then on the other hand, if you're imagining an audience who's like not going to be critical and just supports you, then that kind of inspires you to not go as deep as you otherwise ought to. That you won't shoulder your burden of proof as seriously. That you won't be thinking about your opponents in a more robust way. That you might only engage with straw man opponents instead of really substantial ones that are going to threaten your your position in a way that's actually worrisome which is what we want. We want opponents brought in. Uh, that's going to be really, really important for this paper, too. You can't write a good philosophy paper without talking about objections. Um, that's pretty important. So I think there's a balancing act here. I say I, for some reason, always imagine Morgan Freeman. Maybe it's just the characters he plays in movies and stuff, um, or just that personality I've seen from him in like interviews and things like that. I do not know Morgan Freeman personally. Uh, he's just sort of the image I have in my head. I'm like, I imagine Morgan Freeman's going to be like, I'm interested in what you have to say, but I'm definitely critical. You're not. You're gonna have to convince me of something. 
Um, but do, do whatever works for you. Someone like that. I I I'm, I'm try to be this kind of person when I'm reading root, reading my students' work. You know, um, I'm going to be critical about it. I want to help support you in taking your paper to the next level. But I'm also really curious to see. I want to understand what you've got in mind, what you're trying to go for. Even if I find some criticism with it, I want to support and and see uh, the insight that you've got potentially. Um, Socrates describes himself in a dialogue like this as, as a kind of midwife. He's trying to help this other person give birth to an idea, uh, a philosophical theory. Um, and he's like, we don't know necessarily what you've got here. He, it's like he imagines like laying an egg, and you don't know if that egg is going to be fertile and produce a chick that's going to hatch and grow and, li and life, or if it's a wind egg, like an egg that never got fertilized and no chicken is going to come out of that. So sometimes you don't know going into it, but having that sort of support to kind of see like what are, what could be going on here, how could this make sense? I try to do that too. So that's my pledge to you here in working with you um, as you go forward with your paper uh, that I'm going to try to be that kind of audience for you. Um, but I definitely strongly encourage you to imagine that kind of person as someone who's going to be reading your paper uh, to inspire a good tone of this cooperative truth-seeking sort of thing. Uh, Li Ling, it looked like you had a, a comment you want or a question you wanted to ask. Really not sure how to go deeper and deeper to analyze an issue and answer other questions to be able to argue. Okay. Um, that's a great question, and it allows me to say something I, I love to say to students about this. Um, and I've, I've kind of shared this sentiment before, but um, your, the answer to your question is really your opponent. Your opponent is your best friend. They're your best friend. Um, so you might be doing this thing where you're like, okay, what's my opinion? Like kind of self-reflection, right? Here's a question. What do I feel about this? What do I think about this? Um, maybe this. And then you're like also looking for language to try to articulate that intuition that you have or those gut reactions that you have and maybe looking at your own thinking critically a little bit. But then once you start trying to do this brainstorming of like how could someone try to how, – how might someone look at what I have to say or look at my perspective on this issue and be like, yeah, I don't know about that. I don't know. What about this? I got this concern. As soon as the objections start flying – or you're thinking about all the alternative viewpoints and what they might have to say to recommend themselves. Then you've got something that kind of provokes you. It, it stimulates your imagination. Once there's a threat, um, it's kind of like the old adage, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. So once there's a threat, now your, your imagination is prompted to get creative to try to figure out some way of responding to that. Um, that is definitely my first and I think my best advice for this question about how to go deeper. Um, think about how your opponent can challenge you. What if there's like some, they might say like, hey, you're taking this underlying assumption for granted. Is that really right? And that helps you go deeper, right? Or they're like, what about this other issue? What about this concern? This is a thing of concern. What do you have? How is your position going to deal with that? That can inspire some more stuff too. Um, the way in which a debate goes deeper is in the back and forth of the disagreement in the debate. Like, what about this? Point, counterpoint, counter-counterpoint, so on and so forth. And if you're having trouble figuring that out, if you're having trouble getting inside the head of your opponent and where could objections come from, I can help with that. I'll, I'm happy to play devil's advocate and argue for positions that I don't agree with just to help try to brainstorm where your opponents could come from and use charity to try to get inside your opponent's position, uh, try to get inside their head. And it might... Turn out that whatever thesis you're defending, I am actually your true opponent. I might sincerely disagree with you, and I'd be happy to kind of share my thoughts about that, and maybe that'll help. Um, I don't think that I know everything about these debates, and that's why the research component to this assignment is a really good one to do, and that's why most good philosophy work does involve interacting with other people's ideas, because they might have some other things on the radar that weren't on your radar, and they can help you uh, make your discussion more robust and get get deeper with it um let's keep talking about that going forward um is that help helping li ling cool awesome all right so this video is getting long enough and i want to let everyone here in the chat get to bed so we got one final thing to talk about yes a lot of research to do and, and actually, so you're going to have to do, yes, the code. I've got to do that too. Um, 
you're going to have to do some formal research, like finding these, these quality academic sources to work into your discussion. But like I said earlier, I mean, a lot of research is just this. Just like, hmm, thinking, thinking, thinking. Hmm, what matters here? Just like sincere reflection, self-reflection, maybe trying to understand yourself, like where are my reactions coming from? But also like, where are other people's reactions coming from? Listening is such a big part of good philosophical work. I had a, I had a student ask me one time, they're like, Tim, what do you think is the most important like trait of a good philosopher? And I think they're expecting me to say something like intelligence. I might have shared this story before, actually. I'm having some deja vu about it, maybe for like the syllabus video that I recorded. But my answer to them was um, sincerity. Like looking at an issue and not just looking for some quick answer to respond to it or dismiss it or resolve the controversy so we can move on with our lives. But I think the best philosophical work happens with someone who like looks at a question or a problem, a controversy, and just sits in it and is like, what is the problem here? What is going on? Take that controversy seriously. And that kind of sensitivity, I think, produces the raw material for making really good arguments. Arguments uh, and analyses that are really taking into account like everything that we need to be taking into account. Not just real concerns, but also possible concerns, things that might be a concern. Like Hedinger in his paper uh, for Thursday, he's going to have objections to affirmative action that he thinks are without substance, but people are concerned with them. So he puts them into the discussion, even though he's like, I don't think they carry any weight. I don't think they hold any water, but people are convinced by them. So I'm going to address them. I'm going to take a look at them. Um, sometimes when it's a matter of ethics, that means really getting inside the head of someone you think is really wrongheaded. Um, it's you know, all the disagreement we have these days about politics and stuff in America. Um, there, there's sometimes it's hard to feel like I want to show any empathy or imaginative uh, charity on behalf of those opponents. But that's important for doing good philosophical work. Um, so yeah, so I want to show that. All right, um, let's do the code here before I forget. Um, and uh, well, hey, I've got my my Mr. Spock mug. So hey, that's that's the code, Mr. Spock. Oh, it's mirrored in the webcam, <laughs> but Mr. Spock. That's the code for tonight. Live long and prosper. Okay, Mr. Spock. S P O C K. He's a he's a Star Trek character. Look at him. So logical. Okay. Um. The last thing I wanted to leave you with goes back to this document about the instructions and grading for paper, uh, for the paper. Um, and I have two sort of practical suggestions of routes for how you could go doing the first step of this whole process, finding a topic. Um, one option might be to consider an issue of general ethical import in business, like some of the topics we've already done, fiduciary duty debate. Lo uh, loyalty and whistleblowing, affirmative action, social and economic justice, like all the kind of big picture topics that or international business and moral relativism or stuff like that. Um, all of those topics that we've selected for modules of the class are like big picture controversies that you might want to weigh in on. I've got no problems with you writing on a topic that's coming from our class. Um, I would uh, want to talk to you about your use of sources if you're using sources that were officially assigned readings because I do want you to do research, okay? Um, but um, we let, we could talk about that uh, if you wanted to do something that is connected with what we're doing in the class. That'd be okay. But you also can do something that's completely unrelated to anything that we did in the class. You definitely don't have to write on, on some topic that we explored. Um, and I, I want you to kind of give it a shot too. Don't just pick something from the class because that might be easier. Um, really think about what do you care about? You've got a lot of open options here for what you could write your paper about. And I want it to be something that you feel like uh, you've got some personal skin in the game on, that you are actually interested in it. Um, the less that we make this a hoop jumping activity, the better. Um, I really want you to care about what you're doing. I mean, think about it like here's a paper project that you have to do for the class. 
but it's an opportunity for you to dig into your own thinking in a way that you might want to do. Like this might be a cool opportunity to get to know your own perspectives better on something, or maybe you've struggled with a, an ethical question uh, in the business world that you're like, yeah, I never really thought about that. And thinking about going forward in my career, I, I need to have an answer, or I, I want to have an answer. I want to know what I think about this. Um, so I'm going to try to get this um, answer in th through this paper, through the reflective efforts of what the paper requires. That'd be great. So you could you could have some big picture issue that you're interested in. You're going to have to probably find some focus about it, right? Like each of these papers that we've read kind of focus the issue in one way or another. I can help you with that. But that's one way you could go. Or another thing that could happen is this route. So as like a practical brainstorming device. You could think about a particular event. Like I say here in the document, maybe like the housing crisis of 2008. Um or some, something that happens in the news that you're intrigued by. It interests you. Uh, it's provocative. It seems to raise ethical questions um, that aren't easy to answer, that are controversial, that generate rational controversy, right? And you could use that case as what philosophers like to describe as like a toy case, like a, an illustrative case. Something that's like, hey, there is a big picture issue here. I like controversy, it kind of comes to a head in this moment, like this decision of what someone made or what happened with this business or this policy that they had, uh, something like that. Like um, the Boys Jolly case uh, for um, Davis on whistleblowing. He was like, here's a paradigmatic case of like issues that are relevant to an ethical evaluation of whistleblowing, and let's play with that case in order to say something generally about the ethics of whistleblowing. You could do something like that too. Um, that is a very acceptable way to go. So it's sort of like thinking about a case or an event that happened, an incident that interests you, could be the way of getting into some bigger issue in business ethics. But either way, this is going to have to get theoretical. Your whole paper cannot be a matter of just listing all the facts of what happened in that scenario um, and what you think should have happened. So like I say here, either way, whatever route you take, You'll need to talk about ethical issues that have a general application. I don't want to see your paper only aimed at telling us what should have been done in a specific situation. You can talk about specific cases, but only as a way of drawing out the more general controversies that emerge. So Davis is a very, very good example of this. He doesn't spend the whole paper talking about Boys Jolly. He's really trying to defend his complicity theory of the ethics of whistleblowing. Um, Boys Jolly is just raw subject matter for illustration and to try to um, create some arguments to show like, hey, my theory is pretty good because it can deal with cases like this in a way that the other competing theories cannot. Um, I think this might be one of the more intimidating things about writing a philosophy paper is like having to do this kind of theoretical work to be thinking about making general suggestions and not just highly idiosyncratic things about what's made sense for you in your life and the particular kinds of cases you've had to address, but to kind of broaden your imagination and think about all the other kinds of cases that might be relevant or could that could be of concern. Um, again, talk to me. I can give a lot of help and advice about this. But those are kind of two ways that you might go hunting around for topics. That there's just some general issue that interests you, a general question, you might have that. But you could also approach it through a kind of toy case or an incident or something like that. Okay. I think, I think I'm going to call it there for this video. We've gone over a lot of things, and I, I hopefully have given you a lot of uh, models and kind of structural elements here, uh, some images and metaphors for putting together a vision for how to write a philosophy paper, what I'm looking for, what we're looking for in philosophy out of a good philosophy paper, uh, and how you might attack that. Um, I want to give you, I, I hope it's clear, I mean, I've been saying this the whole time, but I want to give you all the support I possibly can. I want you to be maximally supported and empowered to attack what is a very difficult, ambitious thing to do, writing a philosophy paper. So I'm definitely willing to go the extra mile and have more conversations with any of you anytime I can, um, giving you guidance at every stage of the way that you're willing to let me. I, I'd be happy to be like the most annoying person in the world about this. Um, maybe talking every day would not be practically feasible. But like checking in every few days, if you're like, okay, so I'm picking a topic. I think I've got a thesis. Here's an outline. What about this argument? I just thought of this new argument. What do you think, Tim? I mean, if you want to pester me up and down the street, 
I'm not going to be annoyed by that. I might have to say, like, I'm at a bandwidth limit for how many people I can talk to, but definitely in terms of willingness, uh, my capacity might be limited, but my willingness is unlimited. I would love to work with you as much as you're willing to bring me on board with it. But the ball is in your court to, like, contact me, to look me up, to clear a topic with me, um, to get advice, uh, to kind of tell me what you're thinking. Um, so please, please, please do that, though. I definitely am welcoming that and encouraging that as much as I possibly can here. I'm beating this horse dead, I think. Um, and don't feel like you have to have everything worked out. That, like, you're not going to contact me until you can present something really impressive. If you're just like, Tim, I, I think I want to do something like this. I don't even know how to, like, articulate it. I'm, I've got these really – I'm stumbling over my words. I'm not sure about this. Um, can you help me figure out what I'm trying – to go for like me I'm totally happy to do that um, I'm happy to like have a conversation with you it's basically like hunting down what you might end up setting as your direction or your thesis or your topic or something like that I'm very happy to do that okay all right so that's this video is long enough uh, we're at two hours and five minutes on the video so I'm gonna call that good um, so uh, good night um, see you everyone on YouTube stay in contact I'm here for you anytime all right bye